All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to yet another episode of the FPV Podcast. Uh, we're continuing our uh, beginner series, and this week we're going to be talking about the um, the process of actually building one of your quads, multi-rotors, whatever you want to call. Because uh, on the first episode, we just talked very generally with Paul over here about just the, the sport in general. And then on the on the previous one, we talked about components and so this one we're actually going to be talking about building and maybe some best practices. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce my two guests. Uh, Paul, why don't you go ahead? And... Hi, I'm Paul. Uh, I'm also known as Boba Fett FPV. Um, I, I run a channel that's very focused on kind of telling the true story of becoming a multi-rotor pilot. You know, for every, uh, you know, t three minute video that you get to watch, there's hours and hours of building and practicing and construction and fixing and editing and all sorts of stuff that goes into that process so it's kind of telling the story of the behind the scenes if you will cool cool hey gary gary's new yes. to the podcast so i'm just gonna let him talk a little bit about himself and uh go out. go ahead gary hey uh gary uh, i got my angel um i've been flying since december of last year so just over a year or so um i don't know what else to say <laughs> He's a he's a giant nerd because you can look behind him and yeah. you can see all of his giant nerd stuff and he just got into <laughs> building quads so he gets to have a fresh opinion on building stuff. I think he will yes. anyways. Yes. I am all a right. giant video game nerd and uh do computers for a living, so I think yeah, all of nerd. us do. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. We're all nerds. Okay. <laughs> all right, so there, there's no denying it. There is no denying. It. So if you've been listening to your podcast and you actually like building stuff, I'm sure you've gone out, you've watched videos, you've picked out the components that you love and all of that, and then you have this pile of expensive stuff. So first thing that we're <laughs> – pile of expensive components that you hopefully won't fry. As well as say, once you get it all together and go crash it, you've got another pile of expensive <laughs> stuff. <laughs> <laughs> A broken expensive very, very stuff. <laughs> all right. So before we put it all together, let's talk about the tools we'll need to actually put it together. And like, what are your guys' favorite tools? What do you recommend? Yada, yada, yada. So I'll, I'll start off first. I'm pretty sure all of you know that if you're going to be putting these things together, you're going to need a soldering iron. I think all of us have different types of soldering irons. Um, I have a kind of mid-grade soldering iron. Uh, I don't think I have anything super expensive. It was like $70 off of Amazon, and it gets me by. Um, I don't think I really have anything. I don't think I need anything super special. But So what about you, uh, Gary? Do you have anything super special for this? Uh, actually, I have the luxury of working for a machine tool reseller. And we have electrical engineers, and they actually build their own robot panels and stuff. Oh, and cool. we have a really high-end, expensive soldering iron that I use at my office when I build. <laughs> um, I was do you, told. Do you have a soldering iron at home? Uh, yeah, I bought it at okay. Harbor Freight for three dollars and seventy-five cents. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> that is what I, that that is my go-to soldering iron. The nice thing about those is they get really hot, so you have to be careful with them. They come with a pencil tip, and they burn out real easy. But it was three dollars and seventy-five cents. Huh. That's kind of that. that's kind of neat. What do you use, Paul? Uh, I've got the uh, Weller forty-watt iron. You can get it on Amazon for about forty dollars. Uh, I also picked up a, a couple extra tips for it, so that I have some different things to work with. So I I will use a, a very pointy uh pencil tip like um gary was talking about or a kind of a bigger wedge when i'm doing bigger work like working on uh, escs or something like that but if i need to work on a flight controller i'll put on the the smaller tip okay so both of you explain to me what the finer tip what the benefits are i kind of know but i kind of want to explain it to the audience it's really easy to get into the little small places uh like paul said when you're working on the flight controllers and stuff usually the uh Holes are pretty close together. If you have a, a wide tip, you're going to short something together if you're not very careful. Yeah. And, but then at the same time, having a, a wider, bigger tip allows you to apply more heat across a larger surface area. Yeah. So if you're working with like a big uh, 
pad, like on a power distribution board, you can heat that whole thing really easily and then uh, run your solder into it and same and then wire the wire it up like that. So yeah. So yes, correct. Any tips on actually using solder for people that are actually beginning? Because it's actually can be quite hard sometimes to to learn how to use a fine tip. Because like I I don't know, maybe I just don't have steady hands, but like I have a hard time getting this solder into that one little tiny spot. <laughs> it's a pain in the ass. Less is better. Uh, much like when if you've ever built a computer and you're putting thermal paste onto a CPU, uh, less is usually better. Uh, in practice, uh, I would start out um, just trying to solder stuff together before I start building. Yeah, just mess around with it. Just solder wires together. Get. I think you can even buy like practice PCB boards that you can practice soldering things on for like two dollars or something. I've seen it once. I, I never got one. Um, I started. I started soldering directly onto a little tiny hoop sun. That was the first thing I soldered. You didn't <laughs> care, was, did you? You just started uh, soldering. I just. I just started. I and I went through five hoop sun flight controllers. So. Oh, never mind. You started by <laughs> learning the hard way. What I did, but. Um, uh, and then, oh, what was I? I was going to add to that. Um, oh, solder will always flow to the hottest thing. Exactly. So yes. when you're when you're working on. Um, like a, a pad on a power distribution board, get that pad real hot and then put your solder on it and it'll all just run right into it. And it's, it's really, it's actually really satisfying. Like I really like the feeling of having all the solder, solder go onto it. And then when you're going to apply the um, wire to it, make sure you pre tin it by heating the wire, running solder onto the wire and then heat both mm -hmm. the wire and the pad at the same time. And they'll just right together. Like literally like that. That's my that's my sound effect for it, but uh, that's your sound effect. So yeah, but solder is always going to flow from to the hottest point. So if you keep both things warm, that's going to mix together really well. Yep. And, and be the word, but. if you're going to tin the wire, you don't have to slop solder all over. It just the wire is going to soak up the solder. Yeah. It just takes a little bit. Yeah. I just want to before we move on, just want to say the opposite is true. If you actually use desolder, you want the desolder to be as the hottest thing. And then the solder will actually get sucked right out of that. Yes. Because, like, yeah, it's the same effect. But it, that's actually something that, like, when I first started soldering, I didn't understand that solder flows to the hottest point. And that, I'm glad you actually said that and reminded me. Because, like, that's one of the things where you don't understand unless somebody tells you. And then you're like, oh, I get it now. <laughs> it's like, oh, duh. <laughs> Oh, uh, I'm going to say one thing right now just because I, I'm going to forget it later because I don't know if we're going to talk about it, but never plug in your VTX without an antenna. Never plug in your video transmitter without an antenna. This is this is like totally random. I'm throwing it out there, but that's, that's, there's a life tip for you that will save yeah. lots of pain. Somebody have done that. Somebody must what? have fried no, a VTX. Have. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay, yeah. He, he probably blames me for that VTX too. Uh Okay, so we just talked about the soldering. What other tools uh, do you find very useful that you have on your workbench? Uh, while we're on soldering irons, um, you need solder. <laughs> yep, yeah. that's a pretty important thing. Uh, I really like my solder sucker, which is it's a it's essentially a syringe that is kind of high powered that you you just depress the thing, get it near the solder, and go, and it will suck hot solder off of whatever it is you're working on. And that has helped me with a lot of things, especially with flight controllers where you actually have these what are called through holes that mm -hmm. there, there's an actual um, the, the PCB or, the, or the, pad, the pad that you're soldering to is actual physical hole all the way through. You'll put the wire through and then solder it. But if you desolder that, there's going to be solder stuck in there and you can use the solder sucker to heat it up and pull out all of the, the solder out of that hole so you can do it again the next time. Oh, that's kind of neat. Really, really useful tool, really, really helpful to have on your desk. Something I would like also recommend solder flux um, or solder wick it looks like braided wire uh, it kind of works better for the holes than the than a solder sucker does uh, but it's the same principle you get it hot stick it down there and it sucks up the solder and believe it or not there is a product called flux off flux off. It is flux off it's in it comes in a can with a bristly brush and once you get done soldering you use it to clean the flux off of your board it's entirely electronic, electronic safe, okay. and it literally is called flux off. So flux off, why? I always leave my flux on, so I don't. <laughs> flux on, flux off. Exactly. That's right. 
Uh, you can get it pretty cheap. It's re- it's really good stuff. And I would also highly recommend Helping Hands. Again, it's a Harbor Freight product. Uh, I think they're also like three dollars or four dollars or something. It doesn't matter. They are amazing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So uh, what, yeah, if you want to explain they, what they, Helping yeah, Hands they, are, they they come with two little alligator clips. Usually, I take a piece of heat shrink and put over the alligator clip so I don't bite into my wires comes with a magnifying glass. The magnifying glass isn't too powerful, but it's extremely helpful. Uh, And you can adjust the alligator clips however you want, and you can hold stuff while you're uh, soldering. Yeah, so it's basically... It gives you extra hands. Yeah, gives you clips so that it can hold wires so that you can use both your hands to solder because you need both your hands. Uh, So in terms of like just other tools, like I find it useful to have um, hex wrenches uh, metric yes. all the time. I, I don't yep. think there's ever a point where there is not a hex nut that I need to take off or put on. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I was going somewhere else. No, go uh, ahead. I, well, I was surprised because I've never worked with uh, Cobra motors before. The motor, the nuts that come with the Cobra motors were Phillips. They were? Really? Yeah. I was like, what? This is so weird. Yeah. Are, Are you serious? I'm I've, serious. I've never actually looked. But yeah, I've never no, seen never that before seen, either. I've never seen it either. I was very surprised. They must have ran out and be like, <laughs> "Yeah, I was like, let's throw these in there." I'm glad they fit at least. <laughs> <laughs> While we're on the uh, subject of uh, of hex wrenches and and uh, screws and bolts and nuts and all that fun stuff, uh, blue uh, Loctite. Blue Loctite on motors, especially if you don't yes. want them flying off. I usually put them on my motors and my my uh, bolts that hold the frame together. Yes, you can. I I have a set of um, nut drivers, which is uh, which yeah. are which is essentially a screwdriver that goes over the top of a nut. The nut um, yeah. that really helps with uh, a, a a number oh, of yes. frames. A lot of new frames don't require it, or don't necessarily need it. But like for so when you're mounting your flight controller, you'll usually use a set of um, nylon standoffs and the top thing that's going on that is going to be uh just a nut it's really nice to be able to just tw- twist that down in there without having to get an extra wrench or something like that it's just nice to have um, oh something that i've been seeing a lot lately that i have never considered um is like a lot of people will actually keep a vice on their desk yeah, so like if hobby vice. yeah if you're tinning up your like uh speed controllers or something like that you, it's nice to have it really well locked in place mm-hmm. the helping hands do a pretty good job of it but they're not very heavy usually and they'll move around as you're trying to kind of fiddle with stuff i was uh, so I, i'm kind of i've started to google around a little bit to see if i could find something like that because i think that would be really helpful i was going to mention that we have one at the office and i use it when i'm building at the office and the nice thing about the hobby vice is it actually has a little v in part of the vice so you can actually slide your boards into the notch and hold them real nice and tight oh that's kind of neat. Uh, Never the one we have is from Sears, so I don't know if you can still get them from Sears or not. But. <laughs> huh. It's like, so like one thing that I've come across a couple times is if I'm like deep pinning something where I, I have um, a, so I've got a controller and there are pivot for uh, um, the servo leads that are going into it. Um, you have to be able to pull those pins out as you heat them up. And so, so mm-hmm. you got to solder with one hand, pull with one hand, and it's got to be locked in somewhere and so having a vice would be nice to be able to just pluck those pins out true <clears> enough <throat> i think but something i don't have that i wish i did so you're looking is basically what you're saying <laughs> yep. uh any other tools that uh, you can think of i can think of some accessories that i generally have on me like um i generally have some sort of razor or knife yep. and scissors i usually need to open something but other than yep. that i don't uh, wire okay, strippers. Yeah. Yeah, wire- I was gonna. I was gonna. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was gonna take a jab at you. You need. You need at least a pair of side cutters and or or dikes and wire strippers. Wire strippers. Okay. Uh, What's a see. dike? Electri- electrical tape is good to have. Electrical tape. Yes. yes. Various sizes of heat shrink. Mm. A lighter or a heat gun. A heat gun. I like. I use my heat gun. I have a heat the gun. Size- Zip ties always come in handy. Zip ties like the bread and butter, although that's not really a tool; it's more like an accessory. <laughs> but go ahead. Multimeter. A what? Multimeter. Uh, a multimeter. 
Believe it or not, I very rarely use a multimeter. I have one. I use it, I use it every time I build. What do you use it for? Testing. Okay. I, I just make sure. So anytime, every time I wire something up, um, and I could do it better because you can use it to check for a short anywhere in the thing. Um, but I use it to just check to make sure that voltages are coming out right. So if I'm, you know, using a five volt Palulu, I'm going to check to make sure that I'm giving five volts before I send it into my flight controller. Uh, it's also good to test resistance before you hook something up, so you know you don't have a short somewhere. Or if you're trying to, like on the the four power Lumineer boards, there's a spot on there for uh, one of the uh, step downs. And like on my last build on my tweaker, I didn't put a step down on it. But if you, you can actually meter out and, and jump her over it so you have extra spots to solder stuff on. So it's good for checking for uh, continuity. continuity. Continuity checks are nice, yeah. too. If, if you're worried that a wire is broken or that part of your power distribution board is broken or something, you can touch one end, touch the other, and see to make sure that there is a complete circuit between the two. Uh, just right. to make sure power is so, running. Every time I do a build, I use a multimeter. Uh, and, and, go ahead. Uh, so I was actually going to explain to the, uh, why what dikes were. They're actually it's just a short way of saying saying diagonal cutters. Oh, okay. Yes. I've never heard of that really term before. Yeah, never heard yeah. of that term before. And it's not D Y K E S. It's D I K E S. D I K E S. Okay, I don't have one of those. <laughs> but a couple things that don't always come with your quad that I consider building tools just because they're extra things is uh, a, a nylon standoff kit. You can get them on Amazon for like five bucks. It's just a collection of different size nuts and bolts and standoffs and things. Um, and uh, extra servo cables, like um, just for signal wires. If you're, for example, your receiver is not going to come with a servo wire to connect to your flight controller. Just something I didn't know that but when I first built, I, didn't, I just didn't know that I needed it. And I guess you don't technically need it, but if, um, if you're not going to direct solder those things, then um, it's it's something that's good to know that you need. Yep. And just extra wiring in general is kind of useful. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I just I just placed a, a slow boat order for um, actually servo wires. So Servo wires. Yep. Oh, uh, yeah. One thing I find really useful, and this is only if you build a lot of frames, but I, you know, I, I get a chance to, to look at a lot of frames. Is I actually have a set of uh, files that I can file down carbon fiber, so that like a lot of times when you have a carbon fiber frame, things don't fit exactly right. So it's nice to have some uh, some some files to be able to knock some of the edges off a little bit, shave them off. Yep. Not something you super need, but like. Boy, it comes in useful sometimes. I do. On, uh, on a sad note, the Alien, uh, if you order the frame, comes with its own files. They suck. Hey. <laughs> I'm just telling you, I tried files. using it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, come on, come on. Uh, yeah, yeah, you're right. That's why it's yeah. so expensive. It does come with a lot of stuff, though. I I'll it give it that. It does come with a lot of stuff, yeah. Um, I'm trying to think... It I, you know, I, I would have a, a pair of surgical needle noses and pliers and tweezers. that type of stuff. Yep. I, got made fun of for, I made fun of a long time for not having tweezers when I'm building, and I've probably burned myself a few times because of it. So, yeah. Yeah, nice. Yeah, nice. You <laughs> things, got, get, things get hot even if you're not directly touching with the soldering iron. The whole wire will get hot. So like, yeah. you know, if, you hold it, even if, if you end up having to hold it for a long time, it's going to hurt. <laughs> so, <laughs> using a turn pliers or something like that will help you be able to get that work or your helping hands is good too so it's true uh do you guys use any sort of pad when you're building like a cloth or like uh, some sort of mat i've been wanting to get one i haven't i don't use one either i don't think any of <laughs> i guess none of us use it uh zach has one i've seen zach does have one i I'd, we, we i just work on a wooden bench i mean just as long as it's not going to conduct electricity or anything yep or you're not going to I keep a uh, cutting board that has a groove around the outside. So yeah. if a nut rolls, it'll just get caught in the groove. That's a, that's useful. Believe it or I not. Stole, I stole it from my wife. So. <laughs> <laughs> she she hasn't gotten angry at you yet? There's, we have a lot of cutting boards. It's weird. Like We have like seven cutting boards for some reason. Like oh. That's just how the, the wedding worked out, I guess. Yep. Okay. That's awesome. Whatever works. I yep. don't, I, oh, you know what? I got one more that's, thing. That's this hobby in a nutshell. What? 
whatever works uh i'm just looking at right now i started using it it's actually pretty cool if you like using power distribution board and that's a liquid electrical tape it does work and it comes in different colors so i have like white and red so if i have like a red power distribution board i can just coat it with uh with that and it's just it it dries to a rubbery substance kind of like what goes around wiring and stuff that was actually my project last night I was uh, waterproofing my entire quad, and so it's now covered in liquid electrical tape on all of the uh, exposed circuits. So, <laughs> so is it completely black now? It's just a rubber black thing. Yeah, it's not too bad. You can see it here, but um, like the flight controller and stuff is totally covered. So hopefully nothing shorts out when I fly. And I mounted, <laughs> I mounted this horribly ugly. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> because I, I still like I want periscope. that HD video. <laughs> But um, I was unwilling to fly my uh, expensive um, HD camera around without uh, uh, protection. The the only downside to liquid electrical tape is if you got to take it off, it sucks. Oh, yeah. I bet. I I have not tried yet, and I hope you never <laughs> have to. I just had to do that today. Oh, yeah. Uh, it wasn't it, it wasn't too bad. Like it, it comes it comes apart like rubber. Um, yeah. You you gotta t- you gotta kind of pull and pinch and scrape for a while and eventually it'll come off but it smells good when you heat it up with solder too so <laughs> probably not healthy <laughs> i'm a little high right now uh-huh. that's what he was just doing that's <laughs> rubber what... fumes <laughs> rubber fumes all right okay uh i think have you guys everything that you can think of you covered can move on to if, if more come up yeah we'll, uh, yeah we'll, if, we'll if you think of something you can just pop in and interject but uh coffee. Is a tool of you just thing. wanted to show off your mug don't even lie uh, this, i don't even know what this is from <laughs> oh okay it's not your fpv mug i don't know where no. that went uh so yeah so uh yeah if we think of more tools we'll keep going but um so the next part we're going to talk about is uh, just the, uh, what you find is a good source of information when you're building, because like there's a lot of junk out there, and you know sometimes our podcast is full of junk too, so I, you know it's fine. But is there <laughs> is there particularly a, when Y is here? Oh, so that's all the time then, because I'm always here. So uh, it's a junk podcast. <laughs> yep, that's right. Uh, see, look, Indy Paul over here is already uh, digging in. Uh, what are, what are the uh, places where you uh, most hunt for information and you like, or even just like reading about this stuff? Um, I guess I've got a shameless plug for, uh, <laughs> I started a chat room not that long ago. Uh-oh, here uh, we go. That is uh, just a collection of random people that are interested in FPV and we just sit in it and talk about, you know, the latest beta flight or you know, there's channels for posting your builds and stuff, and so that's actually one of my favorite places now. Is I just kind of just sit there and listen to people and talk back and make fun of people. It's all it's all good. So stop uh, by. What what is it? What's what's the Slack? Uh, it's fpv chat dot com, and you just fill out a form, and it'll get you all the information you need to log in. All right, you you got a chance to show your show your chat. <laughs> that would be a hundred dollars. Get out. All right. <laughs> I what might are, send you your XPR back. You will not. You, I, I can already see you're not giving it back. Uh, Paul, uh, Gary, sorry. Uh, any places that you frequent to get information? You know, Reddit uh, is probably the best place. Uh, the subreddit's Multicopter. Uh, FPV Racing, not so much. I don't guess. They, a bunch of people posting videos. But, um, yeah, the Multicopter. I was trying to think... When I first started, the first frame I, uh, I bought was a ZMR frame. I had no idea what I was getting into. Uh, I bought it off of um, eBay for 130 bucks. It came with, came with the motor and the flight, flight controller and speed controllers. I had no idea what I was doing. And the flight controller was an open pilot, which I hate now. Uh, <laughs> most of us, I think, hate the open pilot flight controller now. Uh, but I spent a lot of time on the open pilot forums, uh, reading up on stuff. Okay. So, uh, and if if you're computer savvy enough, there are a couple of IRC channels uh, to join. Uh, the Clean Flight IRC channel on Freenode is pretty decent. Uh, yep. So, and Dominic is usually in there. He's the creator of Clean Flight uh, Hydra, and he's usually in there, and he's 
uh, believe it or not, extremely helpful. Yeah. So I've so. heard a lot in which he's just, I don't know, he seems like he's always willing to help. Yes, he, he actually really is. Yeah. Uh, Really, I think almost all of the racers at this point there are still there's still a handful of really good holdouts that are using uh, Open Pilot CC three D boards, but most people are, are on Clean Flight. Is there a good Clean Flight form? Is there such a thing? I don't know. I'd have to look and see. Okay. I just go to Reddit or RC groups. They'll all. Okay. What is your yeah. uh, Paul? What is your favorite RC group? Uh, is there any specific? Threads, forums, or channels that, in RC groups that you frequent just on a daily basis? Or you just Google I, it? I usually end up looking at whatever specific content I need in RC groups. I don't necessarily go there to find Anchor. content. Yeah, only, only it's like Stack Overflow. You don't browse Stack Overflow. You just go there when you need to. <laughs> you just Google it and it points you in that direction. It's like, yeah, okay. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's like, cool. Yeah, but I I use Reddit when I just want to kind of get some content to consume. You know, go watch some videos or see some builds, yeah. answer some questions, whatever. Yep. For me, it's YouTube. Like literally, if I have a question, I usually try to get my answers from YouTube. That's why I'm yeah. here in YouTube. Yeah, that's a, <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a good one to mention though. Like there are so many thousands of build videos and how to set up this and how to configure that and how to not blow up this and it's all good. Yeah, I, I do want to mention. Uh, when I did buy my first frame, I had no idea how this thing went together. Uh, it came with this funky power distribution board, all kinds of nonsense. And the first website that I ever went to, and it was he had an ugly build. I mean, I was making fun of it, even though I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> uh, is, uh, is, is, no, uh, Oscar Wang. Oscar, oh, really? Oscar's, Oscar's website is actually yeah, fairly decent. So. Yeah, actually, there's yeah. been quite a few links that has led me over there, and uh, yeah, like he does a good job of you know keep posting new content, so I can't yes. yeah I can't yes. say anything about that because yeah. Uh, yeah. that's a lot of work right there. So cool, shout out to him on that. Yeah. Alrighty, uh, I think we're kind of out of uh, ideas on uh, sources, or we gave our best ones. Yeah. Uh, so just to jump topics, just to something a little bit more fun, because all of us are builders. Uh. What are you currently building? Because I, I think all of you are, in one way or another, building something. Paul, I think I know what you're building. I think it's that XBR that you'll never get done and I'll never get back. No, it's, it'll be done. <laughs> I, 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 I'm supposedly going to receive the new flight controller on Friday because this Monday was Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Yeah. Uh -huh. And uh -huh. so all of the postage was way off. I ordered it over the weekend. Um, but I actually, so I'm building a, a black bolt XBR, which is this awesome little, uh, X frame, um, super rigid. It's if you build it right with the right parts and keep everything as bare bones as you can, you can get it up to like a 13 to one thrust to weight ratio, which is ridiculous. <laughs> That's like, it, it'll, it'll lift like four and a half kilograms weighing only 400 grams with a battery or with a 1000 amp four cell battery. So that's, that, it's pretty ridiculous. Um, so I'm super excited about it. Um, but it's a very tight fit yeah. as a result. And, uh, but, you... so all that to say, I, I, I've rearranged everything and gotten everything to the point where I like it, but I just need a new flight controller for it because something went wrong. Yeah. Anything else that you're, uh, excited about in terms of frames or anything like that? Uh, tons of things. Um, you gotta have to think about it. Uh, I'm really liking my QAV 210. Um, I have the four millimeter version, which is hopefully harder to break. Um, <laughs> and, uh, I'm also going to be working on a, a kind of like a custom built hexacopter for kind of more aerial photography, mission planning, kind of, um, just tinkering. Tinkering. Right. Yeah. So let me translate this for you. I'm going to get my black bolt back in like three pieces and it's going <laughs> to <laughs> Hopefully, I'm, hoping, I'm I'm really hoping to do some uh, to maiden it and tune it out on uh, on Saturday um, yeah. at my indoor track, and I haven't yet I haven't yet broken a frame in there, so maybe yours will be the first. Oh, see, look, he's even promising me now. <laughs> Gary, what what you got? I know what you got. You're never yeah, gonna finish I've it. Got a six inch alien. I've ordered the speed controller, so I'm gonna start on that. Hopefully this week. Uh, and then in the works is I want to actually get rid of. My ZMR frame, it's not the original frame that I bought flash my first frame. I actually sold that. This is the uh, second one. So what is, actually, 
Go ahead. Go ahead. Keep keep going. Uh, I actually want to upgrade it to a uh, uh, put on my big boy pants and upgrade it to a real frame. So, <laughs> you know what frame you're looking at? I'm torn between the F1, the Armiton. The nice yep. thing about the Armiton frames is they have lifetime warranties, and uh, you can break it. No questions asked. Send him back the whatever part is broken, and he will send you a new part. Mm -hmm. um, they cost about the same as every other frame. Uh, I thought about the race blade. I can't stand the name of it. I hate that name. <laughs> I wish they had a better name for it. It's nothing to do uh, with the frame. He just hates the name. <laughs> It's just the name, but yeah, it's pretty bad. some of the some of the concepts are good on the race blade. I, I like that some people were complaining because the arms of the race blade actually attach underneath the frame. They're not sandwiched like the alien. Uh, that it's weaker, uh, but I don't think anybody's broke them yet. Uh, the nice thing about having the arms underneath is if you do break them or, uh, you know, you're flying in a five inch class, you can put five inch class arms on and not have to fly your six inch frame in a five with five inch props on it. And supposedly Lumineer has a quick swap power distribution board that they're coming out with. That's supposed to work really well with the race blade. Um, I'd be interested but, in seeing that, but I, who knows when they, when they're actually going to come out with that though. Yes, yeah, correct. But uh, just to tell you a little bit about the Armitian warranty, because like I was talking to uh, Chris about it, because uh, we were talking about uh, becoming dealers with them, and like uh, he's really on board with the the lifetime warranty. It's not like something that you know. It's, a lot of companies like the lifetime stuff is kind of tacked on. Like when I was talking to him, it's like one of the first things that he'll tell you about it. Like mm -hmm. when you're a dealer. Somebody comes to you with a broken frame. You take a picture. You send it to us. We'll send you a new part. No questions asked. Mm -hmm. He he, you know, he documented out the process, and it's like it's like three steps. Whereas like most warranty repairs is usually like eight hundred. Like yeah. So it's it's kind of nice. So I um uh I, I do think the Armitan lifetime warranty is legit. That's basically what I'm telling yeah. you. Yeah. If I if I was gonna buy one frame right now, it would be the Armitan F1 five inch. Yeah. Maybe V six actually. That's the that's the hole in my inventory right now is the six inch. But uh, yeah, that's kind of what I bought. I bought the Alien six inch, and my thought pro and, and I've tried to fly six inch props, and I didn't like it. I couldn't get my tune right. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was something I was doing wrong. But my thought process was I can fly six inch props if I want to. I'll probably keep five inch props on it, but. I always have that option to go up to six inch if I ever want to. Ninety percent of the the outdoor races that I've been to suit six inch props the best. Yeah, yeah because my... they're big and wide open, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. and you can you can get lots of straight line speed out of six inch, um, and you can you get a little bit more grip going around a corner. Um, it's not as jumpy. Um, whereas with a five inch or a four inch, you're going to, you're going to be using that to snap in between tight turns much quicker than you would with a six inch. So, but with most outdoor, um, courses, you're going to have a little bit more long flowy kinds of things, which suit, um, the six, a six inch style of racing better. Yeah. So yeah. I right now have a ZMR frame, which supports six inch, but it's kind of like, it's heavy and easy to break and ready for something new. You're always ready for something new, but uh, we're, we're kind of jumping to a different subject, but we might as well kind of talk about it just a little bit, like five, six inch props. Uh, there's always this great debate on uh, which ones you, you want to go with, and really it comes down to you, you do want the option, and okay, yeah, sure thing, Gary, you just go ahead. Uh, we could just cut around it and take a break. Uh, yeah, you want to take a break? That's fine. Okay. <clears throat> All right, just returning from our break, uh, just a very quick break. Uh, so the subject that we uh, left off on was just talking about five and six inch propellers because uh, that's actually kind of interesting because one of the things that you know you're gonna have to decide is uh, the size of propeller that you want to swing. Uh, I will say, six inch props are less forgiving, especially if you go for sale right away, uh, because you're talking about a lot of lift and a lot of speed. I mean, like, six, yeah, six inch props are just they, they they give you a lot of thrust, uh, but five inch props. If you turn up your rates a whole lot, 
is really twitchy. So I don't really know. It's like I think both of you like flying five inch in general, right? Yes, I do. Anyways. My opinion is changing slowly. I think for four from against five, from five to six because I'm I'm more interested in racing, and um, you know, so having that thrust to weight, having that extra power is the the most important thing to me, um, and. The, the like I was saying, the the vast majority of courses that we get to fly tend to be long and flowy, and that's designed to let you keep your speed through the whole thing. And having more surface area that you're gripping on when you're going around that corner is going to keep you going around that corner through that line um, and down and around. If I'm just flipping around and flying through trees and kind of just having fun, five inch all the way for sure. So, uh, so you I find agree with that. Yeah, so you find five inch is better for freestyle, and then freestyle six, and tighter courses. In tighter courses, yeah. Uh, what about you know traditional uh, propellers versus bullnose propellers? I well, like, I have I like them both. I don't I don't notice the flight characteristics that being that different to be honest. So uh, why would you choose like a normal propeller over a bullnose? I'm just saying for your opinion. I just fly what I have. <laughs> <laughs> you just fly you usually have. get more thrust out of a bullnose. In, yes, correct. In, in reality, you'll get more thrust out of the uh, bullnose. Uh, a regular shaped prop will actually give you more agility. Yeah, uh, and usually better so. battery life is what happens. In, uh, yeah, also, yeah. So Higher, higher efficiency. Yeah. Yes. So traditional, uh, like, uh, blade-type... Uh, Propellers will give you higher efficiencies, therefore more battery life. But a, a bullnose, which is, I don't know, I see a lot, of, I see almost everybody changing over to bullnose, yeah. will give you better thrust because everybody right. just wants more speed or more agility. And that's just usually what it comes down to. Nobody really cares too much about battery life unless unless you're, you know, doing like NASQUAD or something like that. Yeah, it seems like the, the like especially with the pro racing circuit, you're ending up with... Um, you're going to do three laps. That's the, it, the, the, the race starts and ends after three laps. Um, some, a lot of the regional events I've been to do three minutes and the most laps in those three minutes wins, or you take points and kind of do like this kind of, that kind of system. Um, so then you might choose to go for a higher efficiency thing because if you're going to blow through your battery in two, 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 two and a half minutes, then, you know, you're not going to be like completing as many laps as you need to. So maybe you'll go for something that's a little bit higher efficiency. Cool. But yeah. I've yet I've yet to run into a case where my battery dies before I finish a race, so or crash in a race. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's probably true, actually. It's sad to say. Uh, all right, all right. I've sorry. seen it happen. It hasn't happened to me. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Sorry. Sorry to go off on the tangent, but uh, propellers are actually kind of an interesting subject because. Uh, mm-hmm. It is a component that goes on your quad, and there is actually a lot of decisions to be made. And we we didn't even get into the whole, you know, whether to go with two blades, three blades, and now like yeah. the new thing will be four blades. You know, no. actually, most airplanes are four blades, so you know, it kind of makes sense. But anyways, that's a deeper subject for maybe another day. Uh, so kind of the last few subjects that we will talk to to wrap up. Uh, it's just to talk about um, placement of some of your stuff, your components onto a quad. Uh, I think the most important one, and it's the one that I think most people struggle with, is where to put your video transmitter to where you won't break it every single time you go up. Because I, I think both of you have broken many, many of video transmitters. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, what sagely advice can you impart about video transmitters? Because, like, that literally is going to be one of the things you break the most. Just buy a frame that does video transmitter mounting well. Most I... most of the newer frames come with a um, essentially at the back of the frame where you're going to mount your antenna. Usually, there's going to be a, a hole that is the perfect size for an SMA connector, and that's what you plug your antenna into and that that putting all of the stress on the frame and that connector relieves everything from your vtx so as long as you mount your vtx either with using a a cable that runs from you know down inside your frame up to that hole or if you just use a right angle adapter 
no pressure is now on the VTX to, to take that hit. Um, and so all of the pressure is now on the SMA adapter, which is, you know, 50 cents or the frame, which is very, very hard to break that way. Yeah. Can you show um, us your uh, 210 right there? Because you did it like yeah. that, right? Right. So if you look at this, you can see how the frame has the spot available for that right angle SMA adapter and the, um, the VTX is not going to take any of the pressure from the hit. Um, and so this is a, this is a ZMR frame, you get a little less room to work with. I've done the same modification here, just using, you know, a drill, um, from my garage and the same, the same thing is possible there. So I can just screw the antenna right at the top of that, just the same way. Same advice from you, uh, Gary, any, any other safely yes. advice? No, uh, he hit the nail on the head. Yep. Actually, you you go uh, depending on the VTX. You also uh, have spent time modifying your VTX by epoxying connectors and whatnot, just to try to strengthen it up, right? Yeah, you know the the FX seven nine nine T or whatever it is. It looks like when they were soldering the connector on, they didn't want to melt the plastic connector, so the solder joints on the side not not where the pins are on the board, but on the side, they mm -hmm. fracture real easy and crashes and yeah. they come off. Uh, so I, I went to Hobby Lobby and bought some, uh, I don't have it with me and I can't think of the name of it, but it comes in two different bottles of red and black bottle. And it smells like feet when you mix it together. <laughs> uh, but it, it is strong, strong, strong stuff. There you go. So if you uh, if you worry about your components, uh, a little epoxy can go a long way. Although I don't, I, I don't know. I've, I've started doing that too, as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I've, I've broken. I've broke one unrepairably once, and I've broken one and fixed it another time, and then I epoxied it. So. Yeah, I will say though, if you um, if you do use the frame, like uh, because I have the same two ten. People will you will end up breaking the frame, uh, the top plate more often than not. Uh, eventually, yeah. Because the, there's not a whole lot of carbon fiber behind that, as like as opposed to the ZMR, which has significantly more carbon fiber around it. Well, yeah, it's, that from, tail sticks off at the back there. You can see it's not yeah. super strong, um, but you have to hit it just right to get that to break. And so yeah, so but when you hit it, it's gonna go. <laughs> yeah, I, I have, got I have an extra top plate ready to go at yeah. any time. So. I've destroyed plenty of antennas before I destroyed a top plate. So, uh, actually, some of it has to do with what kind of antennas you use. If you have a very, very soft top or antenna that will that will break first, mm -hmm. it'll actually save your VTX, but you'll have a destroyed antenna. So, yeah. it's kind of yeah, whichever you want. Like the I I I, fl I I do fly with a lot of the immersion uh, antennas. Those things are like tough as nails, and you can replace the cap. But they will break SMA connectors <laughs> because they're so <laughs> tough. Uh, because the stress will just go to that instead of uh, the, the 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 antenna itself. Yep. But uh, is there any place you guys like you like you guys both like mounting in the back? You don't really mount into the center, do you? Because I I've seen a lot of people like mounting the VTX right above their flight controller. Yeah, my tweaker was like that until I put my new flight controller on it, and I mean, there's no advantage to it really. There's not too much advantage that I can think of. I don't think you either. You, have you done that, Paul? I think it's um, just to keep center I, mass. I always put it in the back mm -hmm. because when you're tilting, this is now the highest point, and so you want to have that antenna have the you know the most visibility back to the antenna that you're wearing on your head, even if it's just a small amount. You know, it's still good to to think that way and to plan that way. Cool. Like, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, any other components that like you religiously like to put in a certain spot? Yes. <laughs> Which is? I, I like to put my FPV camera in the front. Be, oh, <laughs> be quiet. <laughs> like it facing out to the left. That way yes. I can kind of pass people. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I just got to follow the person next to me and count yeah, If you can do that, I'd be mighty impressed. <laughs> uh, the, <laughs> that would be crazy. I've actually always wanted to like, um, take, uh, something out the back here and put the fpv camera on it here and like fly it third person 
<laughs> a uh, fly it through person. With, with a tail. Yeah, like like a video game, exactly. So it's like you're playing Grand Theft Auto and all you see is like a quad in front of you. Like, how awesome would that be? That would be actually kind <laughs> But of cool. I, have, I haven't yet done it. <laughs> yeah. You know, there um, is a, uh, off topic, there is a Mythbusters episode where Grant made a car with a camera on the back of it and a, yeah. a full size car. And it wasn't as easy as it is. As is it, as it is in video games. Yeah. <laughs> to drive it in third person, yeah. it would yeah. be super yeah. disorienting to feel to yeah. like look and then feel. Like, yeah, I bet I bet they didn't have a great uh, low response time too. Maybe there was yeah. some lag there. You're funny. Uh, do you guys? <laughs> you got? I think you. I think everybody mounts their ESCs on the arms. Have you ever mounted in a different place? Actually, uh, I guess in the in the old QAV two fifties, they they mounted at the bottom. But most people yeah. just just arms, right? Yeah. Well, actually, so you see how I have these. Can't see it through my six inch props here. Uh, so you see how those green standoffs are between the arms and the two bottom plates to mm-hmm. give the bottom plates a little bit extra room. Right. Um, I had those there originally to put the ESCs underneath the frame. Um, so that they're not out on the arms. And that actually made it really easy to swap arms because I could just unbolt the motor, put a new arm in, and then rebolt the motor, and it would be you'd be good to go. But what I found was that if I ever needed to work on the ESCs, I literally have to take the whole thing apart, and that's like uh, 16 set screws down here and you know a bunch of Loctite later, and it's just it's the most frustrating thing ever. Um, and so it, as I've been building quads and racing them, uh, the thing that becomes most important to me is fixability. If something breaks, you need to be able to swap it out fast so that you can get into the next race. Um, and so moving the ESCs out to the arms and then heat shrinking it in a way that you can actually still reach each of the solder pads is kind of becoming the, one of the more important things to me. Is So you can then really quickly pull that motor off, blip, 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 solder a new motor on, check direction, get back in the air. And you can do that in five minutes um, with a you know butane soldering iron on the side of the thing without having to pull your ESC all the way out, solder, a new ES, solder onto the ESC, push everything back in, put the bottom plate back on, put the arm back on. <laughs> like it starts, it starts to add up real fast. Um, so I build all of my quads to have the ESCs out on the arm with those pads exposed so that I can hit the hit them with a little bit of solder real fast. I don't think you're any different, right, Gary? No, I, I when I first started building, I thought it would be a really good idea to put the ESCs also underneath. Uh, my thought process was, you know, you're flying along and a limb is going to rip your ESC off because it's on the arm of your quad and that's not going to happen. You're going to hit the ground before any of that's going to happen. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, uh, yeah. You don't. You don't need to protect your ESCs. Per no. Se. There's. You're, there's not. Some. If. If you have enough damage to your quad to break an ESC, that's the least of your worries. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> ESCs are in general very strong. I mean, they're. they're well, and really they're just. Well. They're just always in a place that's not like even if it's on the arm or inside like. They're not going to take a hit. Right. Yeah. yeah. If, you, if you can hit a quad hard enough on the limb to break an arm and an ESC, um, send me that video. I'll send you a beer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to go do that <laughs> with one of my junky uh, frames and ESCs. It'd be like a so all of them. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, you, you owe me about twenty beers. <laughs> what? It's not a problem. All right. All right. Uh, that's all I can really think of for that. Oh, oh you know what? One more. Do you okay. like, uh, because like, yeah, uh, like you, you'll get this lipos on the top or on the bottom because on the XBR, it's going to be on the bottom. And then on uh, most of yours, I think the rest of them are going to be on top, uh, where you put your battery. Yeah. Do you, do you guys care, uh, top or bottom for the most part? I know Gary did his for the bottom for a long time. Yeah, you give me a lot of grief about that because I I tore up some batteries. <laughs> Dude, did you see your batteries? Listen, yeah, if you put your yeah. batteries on the bottom, when you land, you land on your battery. Trust me, not many yeah. people land very gracefully yeah. <laughs> ever. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Uh-huh. As long as, yeah. Right, listen, I'm, we'll see what your batteries look like after a while. <laughs> I don't know. I, I mean, I feel like... A, 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 an average crash is going to be way worse. Uh, an average crash on the top 
is going to with a battery on the top is going to be way worse than, you know, 20 decent landings on the bottom, Jeez. you know, and you're going to have an average crash more often than you're going to have 20 decent landings. Ouch, Paul. No, no matter, Ouch. no matter who you are, uh -huh. no matter who you are. Uh huh. Uh huh. Okay. You just called all of us horrible. I just want you all to know this. I'm calling myself that too. <laughs> Uh, okay. I, I, I probably crash out 50% of my flights. <laughs> no comment. See? Look, my work here is done. Uh, we can end now. <laughs> okay, now, now Paul's going to get angry. No, I'm kidding. And Paul doesn't get angry. He just gets even. Uh, <laughs> That's a good one. Well played. Uh, uh, okay, uh, so just uh, going back to uh, soldering real quick. Do you guys? Uh, I, I think I think both of you like to direct solder, which means um, you like to have no connectors on your builds. I actually prefer to have connectors. Is that true? Yeah, my my first build uh, was all pins, and actually my ZMR is all pins right now. But when I did my tweaker, uh, I only put uh, pins on the speed controllers. Oh, uh, nice. Everything else is direct soldered. So speed controller to motors or connectors or yeah, or yeah or uh, right angle pins and the only reason I did that is uh, when I built it really it was before uh, the one wire stuff was actually working working um, mm. so it's like a program on speed controllers and if I, I ever use... need to replace them I don't have to unsolder anything but I use one pin or actually two pins on each. Um, and that's for the VTX power and the um, connection between the VTX and the camera. Um, the m most VTX wiring now comes with a female um, servo lead uh -huh. yeah, right. a and a female JST. And so if I just solder in a male JST and leave the, the, the male... Um, <sighs> uh servo lead on the camera then um it's interchangeable with any um other uh, fpv system that's out there and often when you go to a bigger race event you will be supplied with the vtx that you have to use and so having those connectors already in there is really nice because i can just open it plug the new things in and go um once again coming back to fixability yeah, pretty much. It, it's really helpful to do that. I personally like having connectors on literally everything, mostly because I change out components a lot, just just trying out different combination stuff. So yeah. if you are a tinkerer, you will like connectors. Do you use bullets? I use bullets. I've wow. never, I've never actually had a problem with bullets. So. No, there's no problem with them. It's just you know, if you remove all of the bullets, you'll probably drop ten grams, which yeah. is. Not an insignificant amount, but that's it's, true. On three it's cell, nitpicky, yeah. but no, on a three cell battery, ten grams is a it's significant amount of weight. Yeah, four cell, not so much. You you got so much thrust on four cell, especially if you spin six inch props. I don't think you'll yeah. notice, but yeah, you won't. Yeah, but um, it's, it's all about thrust to weight ratio. It's yeah, how how fast can you get back going the speed you need to be going? Just uh, so when I mean direct soldering, I just mean that uh, all of your wires are soldered together, so there's no way to pull them apart without actually breaking the wire, which or desoldering, <laughs> or desoldering, which you know that uh, I I would contend that uh, that kind of breaks one of Paul's uh, repairability rules because that means if he breaks a motor, he has to bust out the soldering iron. <laughs> I'm I, just saying. I mean, you have a butane soldering in your iron in your bag. It heats up in 30 seconds. You just go blip, 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 done. That's just as easy as pulling out bullet connectors, retaping your bullet connectors, putting them all back on. You do yeah, not it's, have to retape your bullet connectors. Okay. Let's do a race sometime. <laughs> you, don't, you don't tape your bullet connectors? It's already done. Both oh, ends no, there's, has... still, there's still just enough exposed wire uh, on that nope. that you could short something out real bad. I've never had an issue. Never had an not, issue. Not yet, but when you do. <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> yeah. I think Gary's the same way. Gary likes to solder everything together, right? Yeah. It's, cl it's cleaner, it's easier, it's lighter. All right, last subject, and uh, we can call this a day. Uh, both of you 
uh, like this is for the more of the beginner. Like, but when you started, both of you did both of you start with a display or goggles? Did you start? Um, I started with goggles. You started with goggles. Your quantums, right? Yeah, the big old fat quantum goggles. Yeah. Now he wants to show off his fancy new Darth Vader goggles that he just got. <laughs> <laughs> <That's not working. laughs> Gary got Gary's attention. It's like what? What did what did he get? What new Darth toy Vader did he goggles. get? That sounds awesome. Yeah, you have to paint uh, in black for it. What? I started off with goggles, but I, I just want to say that I would consider the Quantums a display because they technically are, right? Yeah, I would they, say so. I mean, they have a they have a Frenzel lens in them. They, or how do you how do you say it? I always get it wrong. Fresnel. Fresnel. Something. Fresnel. I don't know, whatever. Yeah. Either way. Um. But yeah. So I mean, they they are technically goggles, but they're a headset yeah, 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 yeah. instead of a. Uh, you know, like a Dominator or whatever, but I prefer my Dominators now that I have them. <laughs> yeah, I, I started off with goggles. I, I started off with a cheap pair of uh, of goggles. Uh, actually, the box is still right here. Are you serious? Wow, you still have that. Yeah, now. I still have the box. Yeah, the Predator V2 kits, and the reason I kind of started off with that was it came with the camera. So they came with the goggles and the camera. Um. <laughs> I tried the Quantums, and I did not like it at all. Um, <laughs> it was the field of vision. The only reason I tried the Quantums is because I have to wear glasses. Yeah. And, um, I am nearsighted, so I can't see far away. And actually, if I don't have my contacts in, I have to hold something like this. Uh, so I tried to fly without my contacts in, and I couldn't see with the with the goggles. I think they make the the... The lenses diapters. I could put in. Yeah. But I haven't tried them. Uh, and you I haven't tried wear them goggles either. with glasses on. So. Yeah. yeah. That's the reason why. I'm a display guy, but like I'm not a I don't I don't race or anything like that. So for me using a display is fine. But I will tell you the sun is very annoying most yeah. of the time. So you either have to have a very bright display or um, you'll have to move with the sun. But I will say, though, uh, the display is much more forgiving because you can always just turn your head and look to see where your quad is. And that's very helpful when you're beginning. And it's also really hard to land your quad in FPV. Like, I much prefer to land a uh, line of sight than... Yeah, shut up, Paul. That's <laughs> practice. Everything's practice. But, just put uh, it in the grass, not on the concrete, and you're good. <laughs> put it in the grass, not the concrete. Yeah, with tri blades, putting in the grass uh, horribly when you land is it will still bring a prop. Yeah, <laughs> you gotta be careful with those things. They're brittle, man. But uh, they are. but uh, yeah, I I don't know. Uh, if you're starting out, consider you might want to consider a cheap display. It's it's easier to get used to first, but I wouldn't spend a whole lot of money because chances are you're probably gonna move to a goggles, especially if you want to start competing. Uh, in your race events because most people will show up with goggles and it's just easier to tote around in general uh quantums uh not being considered a goggle because they're kind of hard to tote around <laughs> yeah but uh yeah uh that's all i had for this week is there anything else that uh, you think a beginner should know when it comes to building stuff and trying for the first time buy lots of props buy lots of props actually you know what I will say this too. Expect to break a component when you're building. <laughs> yeah. I know I did. I usually always, you know, speed controllers, you need four of them. I always buy five. Motors, I always buy five motors. You know, you're you're going to break something. It's always good to have a backup. So, funny story. The, uh, the first time I powered up my quad, no shorts, no nothing. I didn't break anything through the build, and I actually took it down to the garage and made a knit. First time I powered it up. Don't know how that happened because since then it's never been that smooth. I don't know what happened. <laughs> like, I must have been like so careful during that first try that like everything just went well. But then since then it's like something will burn or I'll have missed something or I'll have a motor spinning backwards or something like that. It's, I don't. Uh, it's very interesting. I don't. I don't know how that happened, but see, it's called recording your stuff. So you're worried about your recording while trying to build, and now yeah. you're distracted, and now you goof up. Yeah, yeah. Oh, 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 oh. This is this is my favorite tip, and I tell it to everybody that I can. 
the first time you power anything after working on it, record it with your phone so that you can see where the magic smoke came from. So that you can just so you can just go scroll back and see, okay, it was that component. No, I'm not kidding. Like that sounds like a dumb thing, but like literally just point your phone at it, power it in, and if something goes wrong, that's a good idea does, actually. But record it and you'll see, okay, the smoke came from over here, the CSC. All right, that sucks, but I know which one it is. I don't have to replace everything. I that's actually and and then you you can share it with people online if you need to or you know it's it's good record just record shit just, stuff just... when you when you're working on it and you can share that and get questions answered all that stuff actually you know there's there's a lot of forms that if you can just show them what's wrong they'll there's somebody out there that's done it and will help you it's yep. it's the truth I've only had one problem that I couldn't find an answer for so what's that what's that problem. Uh, it's all documented. Don't worry. It's all documented. You'll, fi- okay. you'll find it if you have it. You'll find my response, my fix. If, if you Google I'm not even it, tell you what it is. If you go- I'm gonna go look for it now and just tease you about it now. Okay, Gary, you got any uh, magical sagely uh, advice to a a new builder? Any? Uh, yeah, I will say that with my first build, and I learned the hard way. Uh, the motors that came with my build was Emacs motors, and it came with a whole slew of mounting hardware. Um, make sure that whatever you're mounting your motor with is not touching the windings on your motor, yeah. um, because you will destroy a motor that way. Yeah, so if you look underneath your motor, you'll see a bunch of copper wound, wound together. You never want a screw touching copper. Yeah. Bad, thing, yeah. bad things will ensue heat. Heat will magically happen. Your motors will magically get really hot, <laughs> and things will break. Yeah, uh, yeah, but and and uh, I will say, don't get too cocky and just put everything together. Uh, I learned, you know, building computers in the day that test one thing at a time. Yep. Yeah. As you're going, power it up. Check for smoke. Check motor direction. Yep. Move on. Yeah. You, and you, if you can. Think you it's... can. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, uh, you can it, power. It, it... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you can power one motor at a time, and you can use Clean Flight to test each motor. So, like, you can, you can make sure everything's working, and then you can test your flight, your FPV gear by itself. You can test your flight controller power by itself. You, so you can do each of those things as you go. Sorry, and, ahead, uh, Gary. Double check your wiring, and even if you still think it's right, check it four more times. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one thing that I that stuck with me, and Paul said this: don't build angry. If if you yep. find yourself getting frustrated, just put it down. Go watch some YouTube, Netflix, whatever. Just just let it go because yep. like don't don't build right after crashing if you're just flying for fun too. Yeah, that's that's never good. That's not good. <laughs> if Zach was here, he could attest to it. Uh, <laughs> you will get angry. Yep. Uh, it, it, there was many a times that I told Zach that I was done with this shit. And, was just walking away from it. I remember uh, just... one at least. Oh, do you? Yeah. If you ever meet Gary, ask him about the video camera and the cat that he forgot to take off. It's really funny. <laughs> yeah, let's. I can't believe you remember that. I had to about that. Holy shit. Uh, Paul, if you ever. You should ask him about that story. It's really funny. I will. I don't even remember. Never mind that. Oh yeah, I do. I I I was flying and I hit a tree and busted my FPV camera. Ugh. Uh, and then I got a new one and I hooked everything back up and tested the video and I had no video and I was so freaking angry. Uh, and come this, to find out, it's because I had my lens cap on. This was a period of days, by the way. Like he That's, was yes. angry about it because days? he was testing over days. days. I don't broke build. stuff because I didn't have video. Don't build and then mad, I found guys. out the lens cap was on. Don't build mad, guys. <laughs> yes, do not build angry. <laughs> have people double check it, too. That's always nice. And Take check. pictures, record video. Somebody, some guy on the internet will, dude, your lens cap's on. <laughs> <laughs> dude, remove your lens cap. <laughs> when I heard that, like, literally, he was bitching about no video for two days, and then, like, yeah. he comes on, and he's just so angry, and then he types, I forgot to take my lens cap off, and I just started <laughs> dying laughing. You know, it, it wouldn't be an issue, because now, 
my camera, we have the OSD stuff, and I usually put my name on the OSD. Yeah. Uh, but I didn't have a normal, like, uh, a multi uh, OSD or anything like that. So, yeah. anyways. It's crazy. Crazy. All right. We're we're done for the day. Uh, Paul, where can we find you? Go plug your stuff so we can end the day. Uh, you can find me at youtube.com slash C slash Bulbafet FTV, B U L B U F E T F T V, or uh, paulmerkel.com. Uh, both of them have uh, content that is supplemental to each other that uh, can be fun to look at. So. Cool. What the heck are you doing, Gary? Oh, I was looking at something on my other monitor. Sorry. <laughs> there you go. You weirdo. Okay. You have a YouTube channel. I don't think you have anything else unless you want to plug your other things. I just I've got a Twitter and an Instagram. It's Twitter Instagram slash Gwangel eighty eight. Um I don't I mean I do have a YouTube channel, but I have no idea what the URL for it is. Okay, yeah, you don't you haven't uh put together haven't, I'm not cool enough to have enough subscribers yet. Listen, word of advice, just if you uh if you have a website that you like the URL to, if you just authenticate that website, you can get that link. Okay. So that's what I did. That's how oh, I got my link without having 100 subscribers. So I can okay. get like FPV Race League if I own the URL FPV Race League. Oh, okay. I see what you're saying. Okay. Yeah. So it's uh, So that's something that if you're new to YouTube, you can do that. The process for re registering through uh, Google is a little bit complicated. If you're not a tech guy, you might struggle with it a tiny bit, but you can struggle through it, and it's worth it because, like, otherwise your URL is like youtube.com slash yeah. 20 numbers and letters and stuff. Yes, yes. But cool. All right. Thank you to both for coming along, and uh, we'll have another podcast in another week. See you all later. Sounds good. See you. All Thank right. you. Good.